Good evening, everyone. Once again, I, Dr. Priya Vani, on behalf of Academia IPSM, would like to welcome you all to this 37th PG lecture series on eConnect platform. The topic for today is Implementation Research in Health Sciences. Implementation Research it's an interdisciplinary strategy that has recently found its place and utility in addressing complex health problems in low middle income countries that we have severe resource constraints. But to know more about it, today we have with us Professor B.R. Shama, Professor School of Medicine, University of Hyderabad, Telangana. Sir has done his MD from AIMS. New Delhi and double diplomat of National Board in Maternal and Child Health and Social and Preventive Medicine. Shamana sir, the, well, we welcome you. We welcome you on behalf of IPSME Connect. Without wasting any further time, over to you, sir. Ah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Priya, and uh, thanks everyone at uh, IPSM Connect and uh, for the wonderful job uh, you're doing in terms of uh, these PG lectures. Uh, no, I, I thought uh, I should also engage with a relatively younger group of people. I think my generation is or the generation of the 90s when I did my post-graduation. So uh, it's nice to be uh, talking to all of you all about something which uh, I think uh, has been confronting us day in and day out in terms of carrying out uh, tested interventions in real life situations. And that is cloaked under the banner of what is called as uh, implementation research. So what I will do today is I will take you through implementation research in health sciences. Basically, uh, I will talk to you about uh, what exactly uh, implementation research is, uh, what are the strategies we use in implementation research, and uh, the importance of asking the right question uh, in implementation research share with you some methods and frameworks and uh, on a personal front some of the experiences which we have had in terms of implementing implementation research or translation research projects so that is the structure of the presentation in the next 35 40 minutes which i would probably share i guess uh, all of you are quite familiar with what's called as the mechanics of failure uh, we have a health system and we have healthcare programs and the healthcare programs are so many that the health system is not able to support it. And that's probably the reason we have what's called as the mechanics of failure. And uh, the fact of the matter is, all of us probably are theoretically trained and we have a lot of knowledge with respect to a lot of you know, interventions and strategies and how to go about things. But there is definitely a gap between what is called as knowledge and need. And this, gap needs to be bridged and that probably is done by what is called as implementation research implementation research has evolved over a period of time earlier it was called as translational research dissemination research etc currently the term which everybody sort of favors is the fact that this bridge between knowledge and need which is implementation research so what basically implementation research does is bridging the gap. Now, you probably would ask me, what are the challenges? I think the challenges which all of us have to understand is we have proven interventions. And when we talk of proven interventions, all of you know about what is called as efficacy and effective nice uh, trials, et cetera, more so efficacy trials, wherein these are things which are done in very, very ideal conditions. But when you want to take them to the real life uh, situation, you face or confront a lot of complex issues and challenges. And implementation research basically looks at how to take proven interventions and implement them in the real world. So, uh, like I said, it has to work in diverse settings and across health systems. Understanding for the fact that one size does not fit all, I think, that is a very, very critical thing for us to understand that one size does not fit all. And hence, we'll have to make sure that we devise methodologies and complex strategies or complex sort of interventions in terms of how do they work in diverse settings and across health systems. The fact of the matter is, 
uh, most often than not, uh, why this becomes more important is because of the situational factors or contextual factors which exist. See, what may work in Mumbai, in Dharavi, may not work in, say, in Hyderabad, in, uh, in, uh, in Parsi Gutta or somewhere. Or what may work in, say, Delhi, in uh, Ambedkar Nagar slums, etc., may not work elsewhere. So I guess we need to understand what may work in a rural area may not work in an urban area. What may work in a rural area may not work in an area which is inhabited by what we call as particularly vulnerable tribal groups in, in terms of marginalized and vulnerable population. So contextual factors matters a lot. And implementation research actually looks at understanding the interface between what can be achieved in theory and what happens in practice. And that is where I think it becomes extremely critical for us to look at what implementation research is. So we need to understand that uh, implementation research in the true sense uh, does not conform to what we call as evidence-based because uh, you have to think on your feet. You have to think realistically when it comes to implementation research. You can't go through all the evidence-based methods and the hierarchy of evidence generation, et cetera, et cetera, in implementation research, which means that implementation research is much more complex. But at the same time, the methods or findings are warranted and the methods are very transparent. And this is where we use a plethora of methods. When I say a plethora of methods, we use a combination of qualitative methods, quantitative methods, mixed method, research methods, even things like, you know, uh, participant observations, uh, participatory rural appraisal, et cetera, which fall under the broad category of implementation research methods. The critical thing in the implementation research is to generate the question or to generate the right question in order that we could answer it. And if you generate the right question, and mind you, questions don't come easily. All of us know when we put together our dissertation or thesis, etc. the toughest part happens to be to arrive at a question which you can answer and convert it into an objective and then look at the methods, etc. Implementation research, you know, we say question is the king when it comes to implementation research. And the complexity is about reflecting the real world situations. And I told you that, you know, it's you, you don't anticipate or there are unpredictable things which happen when you're doing these or when you're taking these interventions to the real life situation. So there has to be continuous adaptation. And that is where you can't follow a prescription or a straight jacketed method. You have to look at adaptation based on the situation. And that is very, very important. As we go forward, we are going to be confronted with more complex sort of health issues. We need to devise methods which may work in one situation, but will not work in another situation. And this continuous adaptation becomes extremely critical. Right? This is more of a framework in terms of the theoretical approach in implementation science and the five categories of theories, models, or frameworks where you're looking at you know, what's called as the process models of translating or guiding the process of translating research into practice or the determinant fra frameworks where you're looking at understanding or explaining what influences implementation outcomes and the evaluation implementation or evaluating implementation in terms of the evaluation frameworks. And when you're looking at, uh, looking at the theoretical frameworks, either you can use a combination of all of these or singly one of these, or a couple of these, etc. And that's why it's important for us to look at these uh, frameworks. And I've given you the reference underneath this particular slide, which you can look at, and which is not very old. It's in the last decade. So this is another, uh, you know, I, I was telling you about, uh, it was called dissemination research or translation research in the earlier days. So if you look at what Detsky proposed, and this is a stepwise approach, which all of you are very aware of in terms of really looking at carrying out basic research or fundamental research, then getting into lab-based research or what is called as bench research, then getting into what is called as the, 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 the basic research, bench research, and bedside research, and then ultimately the brass tacks 
sort of implementation wherein you're moving through this stepwise manner of fundamental research, efficacy, you know, sort of establishing efficacy, safety, and all those kind of things, then effectiveness. So you must have heard about COVID vaccines being very efficacious because it was tested in a lab, 80%, 85%. But when it comes to the real life situation, its effectiveness was about 40%. Now, the question is whether 40% effectiveness is something acceptable when you have so many people who are at risk for COVID. So if you look at the, uh, what you call cost and effectiveness, or if you look at the efficiency versus effectiveness, I guess it's important for us as you know, policymakers, et cetera, to really understand that even 40% effectiveness in a real life situation means you're saving four out of 10 people in terms of preventing serious complications of COVID. So we went ahead. So that is the understanding with respect to looking at efficacy, effectiveness, and the model of delivery in terms of efficiency. Uh, you know, how best we can deliver this intervention. Uh, should we, uh, like for instance, like the way we do uh, national immunization days when it comes to polio, et cetera. It's an implementation research question. Then the availability aspect and the distribution channels or logistics, which are also very critical when it comes to implementation size sciences. So what I wanted to tell you is it's not about just generating evidence from research, but the critical thing of synthesizing the evidence, using evidence base to develop clinical practices and then converting them into public policy. So making clinical decisions also depend upon a lot of subjectivity. And we have seen this and I will explain to you in my future slide in terms of what this subjectivity and what this end user perspective is, and it's very, very important. So all this we are doing in order to convert the current state into a desired state, because there are a lot of gaps to be bridged and implementation research actually devices, you know, it's, 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 it's very, very, uh, you know, uh, what should I say, dynamic in terms of looking at development of action plans. Also, the fact that I was telling you that can we invent a solution to a health problem? Most often than not, it happens in a lab or what we call as bench side research. Then can we take what is at the bench to the clinical uh, environment or what we call as bedside research? And then can we implement it in or can we look at the benefits which somebody who gets this intervention gets through, you know, does it benefit patients? Then can it be translated or can it be delivered reliably reliably into practice and then not to forget can we scale it up and can we scope it up uh, the most critical question these days which everybody wants to answer is about using artificial intelligence and machine learning methods etc cetera, etc cetera. you know it was above our head to understand what artificial intelligence was three decades ago when we were residents ourselves but today uh, we know that there is a role for things like artificial intelligence. But at the same time, we also have to understand that can it replace a human interface when it comes to something as emotional as healthcare? You want to look at, you know, you can have a robotic surgery and all those kind of things done. But it's important also to have that human interface in terms of, you know, the patient provider communication and you know, sort of satisfaction and delight and all those kind of things. So this is very, very critical when it comes to implementation research. Uh, my teacher, as well as uh, senior colleague, uh, Professor Venkat Narayan at the Emory University, uh, the uh, Emory Global Diabetic Research Center, uh, talked about translation research or implementation research, as we call it today, in 2004. He said it's about transforming currently available knowledge into useful measures for everyday clinical and public health practice. And it looks at implementation of standards of care, understanding the barriers to the implementation. Like for instance, just look at tuberculosis. We have the medicines, we have the strategy, uh, we still have a big problem in terms of resistance, etc. Where is the sort of gap or what is the barrier in terms of implementing this uh, thing. We have time-tested interventions, their efficacy is proven. 
if you take it for so many days, et cetera, et cetera, all that is done. But at the same time, you have perspectives at the end user end, which is not within your control. You can take the horse to the water or pond. You can't make it drink sometimes. That is what happens with a lot of our interventions. But we need to understand, we need to also look at the barriers to the implementation, and we need to intervene at all levels of healthcare delivery and public health if you are looking at improving people's quality of lives. And that is where I think the Annals of Internal Medicine, a landmark seminal article published by Professor Venkat in 2004, talks about implementation research. So what I'll do now is uh, I'll probably share with you a very interesting experiences which we've been having. Uh, for some of you who don't know, <coughs> I had a fellowship in public health leader or what's called as Public Health Leadership Academy of Implementation Sciences, working with Professor Venkat and Muhammad Ali at uh, uh, Emory University in Georgia, Atlanta. Uh, during that time, uh, when I went through the thing and when I came back, one of the first things I uh, tried to do is to look at these questions related to implementation research. And one question which was bothering us and which continues to bother us is probably this, uh, you know, increased uh, C-section rates in the state of Telangana. If you look at the state of Telangana as per the National Family Health Survey of uh, the latest one, 2019, uh, the C-section rates in the state of Telangana overall aggregated is 60.7. No, six out of 10 women land up in C-section. On one side, we are fantastically, you know, increased institutional deliveries. But we, at the same time, we see that those people who get into the institutions, most of them end up having C-sections. Now, what are the reasons? Is it driven by the provider? Is it driven by the system? Is it driven by the mothers themselves? So uh, when we did this particular thing with the help of our students and, you know, basically MPH students of thing, and we got support from the government of Telangana and the UNICEF, very interestingly, like I said, this is outdated, but, uh, 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 you know, that is one thing which Telangana has, although it has increased in the Nitiayo green uh, rating for uh, health, when it comes to uh, uh, deliveries, it's increased to more than 99% of institutional deliveries, but the C-section rates stay somewhat around this mark of 60.4 or 60.7, with private almost in some districts, it's 8 out of 10, 80% private uh, uh, deliveries in private healthcare facilities are done by C-sections, and in public facilities also, it's reaching to things. If you look at uh, the norms or the guidelines, it talks about community-based C-section deliveries to be about 20%. That's what it talks of. And you're looking at three times that number here in this context. So we wanted to look at implementation research and we wanted to develop a framework. And the critical question which we wanted to answer is, through a, using a mixed method study in units and facilities, Across the spectrum of rates of CZ and section, when I say across the spectrum, there are districts which have very low rates. There are districts which are in the average rates and the districts very high rates. We wanted to study what are the reasons why people have this kind of a thing. When we looked at it, interestingly, we had to use a combination of methods. First and foremost, we had to get a lot of information in terms of uh, thing. And mind you, uh, getting data from sources has been big a challenge and people will not share with you the information, et cetera. But at the same time, we wanted to establish what are the sort of variables which fall under the medical, social, cultural, economic perspective, which we wanted to capture. So we looked at a mixed method study approach, in-depth interviews, focus group discussions, stakeholder engagement. As a matter of fact, we did what is called as a 360 degrees inquiry method. You know, talk to everybody who's concerned with that uh, mother, whether it is mother, mother-in-law, partner, husband, A&M, Anganwadi worker, uh, you know, Asha worker, uh, obstetrician, uh, nurse, midwife, etc. So we selected, like I said, districts which had high C-sections, medium C-sections, and low C-section rates relatively within the uh, within the state, and we went ahead. And what we found is. There are a lot of what are called as personal and family determinants. Very interesting. He said, these times, 
there are smaller families hum do hamara do type where you have uh, even the mothers saying that look in my during my time i used to deliver six or seven children or 10 or 14 children uh, cricket team with a substitute etc but i used to deliver normally in the morning go into the fields in the afternoon and work i never had a problem but this is my daughter or daughter in law i want a safe delivery for her the reason is she got married late she is going to have a late uh, you know of spring or kid and make sure that you deliver her safely and what is the safest word of deliver c sections mother is happy family is happy even the provider is happy because 9 minutes skin to skin they will do a c section and early rehabilitation then there are community determinants very interesting they see the live lived experiences in the community he said when you go and ask them don't you think that this is uh, an intervention this is a surgery they say look my sister had it my neighbor has it apparently my uh, uh, you know cousins had it my pedamma had it my chinamma had it you know my uh, all my family have had c sections a c section is the new normal that is what we got to understand when we went to the community systems deter- you know the determinants like for instance staff shortage there are not enough people to do normal deliveries so an obstetrician doesn't have time to sit there and wait for doing wicket keeping there he or she has to attend to other cases as well so we have to manage expectations and at the same time if something goes wrong during normal deliveries there is the fear of medical legal issues there are systems issues policy determinants as a matter of fact i don't know I, i if it is true of all other states in uh, telangana state we had a policy or still exists wherein you have to have the third antenatal care and the fourth antenatal care into a facility which has ultrasound invariably or imaging facilities invariably if you land up at that facility which is a district hospital or an mch center you get drawn into a cesarean section if they don't do do a cesarean section the nursing home opposite to this facility will do the cesarean section because in a district like say karimnagar there is a doctor street right opposite to the government hospital so if it says you can wait for some more time it's still you know just 38 weeks etc two more weeks to go they just land up outside and they are facilitated c section done and these people wouldn't even know and uh, v back or vaginal birth after c section is not something which these people take or tend to do even if they have the skills previous lscs surgery seems to be the highest indication or seem to be the highest indication for repeat c sections if we had not done this kind of or if we had not asked these implementation research questions it would have been very difficult for us to actually and from all this what you understand is we can't get this information through doing only quantitative research or only qualitative research we need to use a combination of methods we need to be persistent patient etc and that is where i think it's very important for people who do community medicine or public health to understand this personal and family experience determinants like i said elders peers etc system determinants although the phc medical officers anm staff are well trained they are available at the phcs etc transition management and availability of labor room staff or non availability of surgical facility in the vicinity you know in case there is is a referral needed or distance from the referral facility seem to be very big problem and uh, you know we, we told uh, in no uncertain terms to the commissioner it that you can't use what is called as a carrot and stick policy where in carrot yes it works if you so they started paying an incentive for doing more number of uh, you know normal deliveries but when it came to stick policy a lot of people who genuinely needed c sections were not provided that in time and hence you know there were cases where mothers had still births and that has been the most worrying factor so the bottom line or the moral of the story is cesarean section has to be offered to those people who need it but at the same time it should not be done unnecessarily now who decides what is necessary and what is unnecessary from this experience you can make out that there are what is called as cesarean on demand on a particular auspicious day i know for sure that february 29th there are a lot of people who are going to be 
waiting for a cesarean section on that day because apparently delivering on a leap year day seems to be very, very good. So I'm trying to tell you these are the sort of questions which uh, you need to ask. So, you know, we had to allay apprehensions, provide a supporting environment, recommend about cap staff shortages, capacity building, guidelines, best practices, feedback to referral institutional institutions, personalize and continuity to care. And also, you know, assure people that there would be some legal sort of protection against, you know, possible thing. And just doing this got one of my PhD scholars to work on workplace violence among healthcare professionals. It's very interesting because that is an implementation research as well in terms of really protecting our healthcare staff within their workplaces. Doing all this, I guess uh, we were very uh, fortunate that we got a grand challenges uh, grant from uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And we were uh, working with University of Central Lancashire and WHO and also a couple of universities on the legal side in Canada and on the obstetric side in Brazil, et cetera. South America or Brazil and Argentina are two countries which have very, very high C-section rates because uh, women there, for whatever reasons, prefer to deliver premature. It's very interesting, but you need to look at it as well. So we got this particular grant. We were able to do a lot of capacity building, et cetera. Uh, you know, engage legal profession, engage the Federation of Obstetric Gynecological Society of India, et cetera. As a consequence of all this, uh, we were, you know, very fortunate that we get got two or three of our publications, couple of them in the pipeline, but at the same time, a couple of uh, publications also published in high index or Scopus index journals, etc., wherein we were able to look at the reasons and also look at reviews in terms of different uh, places, including India, in terms of the behavioral factors associated with what is called as sphere of litigation. And that's something which we published as well. So just to tell you, it's not about raising the right questions, but finding the right methods to answer that particular question. The next very interesting sort of an experience which I wanted to share. So I thought it, keeping it really theoretical is not going to help you all. When I convert this theory into practice, just like the way implementation research does, you will probably uh, understand it better. So the second was more interesting. The Department of Biotechnology, Government of India, actually gave us a project in terms of uh, with 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 uh, you know my principal investigator who happens to be a research scientist, basically a nanotechnologist. She was keen to develop what are called as these micronutrient patches, and uh, these micronutrient patches are transdermal. They look like your band aid or they look like your you know nicotine patch, etc. But only thing is, instead of spiking it with protein, we are spiking it with uh, iron, uh, folic acid, vitamin B12. So here we looked at iron and B12. And we looked at this particular thing wherein the principal investigator actually applied twice, was not successful. When the third time she came to us and said, how do we get this through? Because this is a very important issue because there's a lot of problem taking iron orally or through deep intramuscular route in terms of uh, you know the consequences uh, constipation when you're already pregnant uh, acidity and all those kind of things so we wanted to do something on uh, this when we looked at it interestingly we got to know some of the background information which we all of you know in terms of uh, uh, the anemia prevalence and uh, conventional oral or uh, iv or intramuscular thing in terms of low compliance rates low bioavailability uh, if you have gastrointestinal problems, absorption, et cetera, side effects, fear of inj injections, pilferages, other, you know, even the drugs which you get, iron folic acid, sometimes you don't know what you're getting if you're getting it from, say, for instance, a Bagirath Palace in Delhi, et cetera. So pilferages, malpractice is another problem which occurs with this uh, particular thing. So the critical thing was the nanotechnologies looked at developing the optimal polymeric matrix with various iron and vitamin B12 content. She designed and fabricated the micro needles. She characterized it both in the lab, in vitro and in vivo, and told us, look, if I put this patch, which can be self-administered, one into one inch 
in terms of its size, transparent. You just apply it where even the mother or even somebody who's a lay person can apply it. It will re it will supplement or complement it complement your recommended dietary allowance for a week. So you just have to apply this patch once a week. But I said, I asked them or I said, you're sure about the patch. Are you sure about whether the people would accept your patch instead of taking medicines and injections? So they said, why don't you include what's called as an acceptance survey? So we went ahead and did the acceptance survey in terms of uh, thing. And the critical thing was at the moment or as I speak, there's still no nutrient containing micro needles in use. There are very few containing it, and but these are not long-term sustainable release micro needles, etc. So fortunately, through this grant, we got it done, and we were able to characterize everything. And as you can see uh, from these things, it resembles just something like a hair follicle or the micro needle. It's nanotechnology, basically using a nanotechnology, etc. But the most important thing was if you take it to the people, will they accept it? That was an implementation of such question. And we did it among, say, 481 stakeholders, primary stakeholders. When I say primary stakeholders, 419 end users in three districts, community-based, and 62 potential community-based providers. When I say potential community-based providers, the people who hand over these tablets or who can apply the patch in terms of the PHC medical officer, the health worker, male, female, a &M, et etc. Interestingly, uh, none of these people, as a matter of fact, almost 97, 98% of the end users and more than 95% of those people who were supposed to apply this patch never had any issues with respect to does it contain iron, does it contain B12, etc. The problem they had was what will be the color of the patch? Where will you put it? Will you conceal it under my blouse? Will you apply it in an area which cannot be seen by others? Is it painful? The softer sort of things became more important than the micro needle patch itself. As a matter of fact, they said, can I apply it on my child if the child needs iron supplements? Said, that's a, that's a very important uh, sort of question which we were able to answer, wherein you don't require uh, logistical support in terms of somebody going home, applying the patch, checking, all those kind of things. If you establish the safety and efficacy, which we will do through clinical trials or community-based trials, it looked like the patch will work wonders. And this is one form of implementation research questions we answered as part and parcel of health technology assessment. So, you know, just to tell you, I think you need, all of you need to understand it's a multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary sort of an approach where this is emerging as a very big frontier when it comes to global health or public health, wherein you're looking at not only identifying, analyzing, developing, you know, solutions, implementing and evaluating them, but you're using different methods. And this wagon wheel will show you how you go about doing it using the plan, do, study and act cycle. Uh, this is a fantastic sort of summary of what I have presented so far with respect to implementation research. So you also need to convert or create this feedback diffusion loop in terms of what we call as the struggle which we have every day. We know that there is an intervention, a very effective intervention or very efficacious intervention. We know that there are people who are waiting for that intervention. Why are we not able to get the demand and supply meet with each other? Why are we not meeting the demand with the supplies which we have? So diffusion, dissemination, implementation, adoption, and sustainability of what is called as the diffusion, defense, dissemination, implementation continuum is very, very critical when it comes to taking or addressing the challenge of implementing uh, implementation research in health sciences. I guess that is my uh, thing. But in conclusion, as much as raising key questions are important, there is a need to take this to a logical endpoint in terms of conceptualizing and implementing projects and also sustaining them or institutionalizing them. A project becomes a program, a program becomes a portfolio in terms of 
the institutionalizing them. And it's also very important that as, you know, young budding researchers, people who are postgraduates, senior residents, junior faculty, et cetera, I think there's a need for all of you to develop more understanding in terms of implementation science and implementation research. And please understand, failures are stepping stone for success, meaning as an entrepreneur or somebody who thinks the more you fail, the better you become in terms of your success rate in later on. That is what we think. But at the same time, we need to have investments when it comes to implementation research. But we need also, you know, there's a lot of people developing technologies right, left, and center. Everyone is an entrepreneur. Everyone has a product. Everyone comes up with new things but very little on how best we can use them. And that is where this perspective of using what is called as a 3D, 60 degree perspective is very, very critical and very useful. For some of you who may be interested, very recently, uh, my colleague at the university, who's actually a health psychologist whom we work with very closely, she just retired along with two other faculty, have come up with this very interesting book, a book published by Rutledge, which is the health psychology contributions to the Indian health system. And uh, chapter four, I have dedicated in this book uh, to implementation research for both public health and preventive healthcare in India. Uh, it's a very interesting sort of a thing. It has various uh, chapters and each chapter in itself is a fantastic uh, sort of addition to the knowledge base of what all of you should do. Thank you very much for the opportunity and I hand it over to uh, Priya and the IAPSM Connect team for uh, taking it further. Thanks again. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, we we really thank you to giving us for giving us your valuable time, sir, and teaching us this topic. I am sure that after learning, our students will be able to understand the nuances of implementation research and its application in healthcare. Sir, once again, can you please let us know the difference between implementation research and operational research, sir? Yeah, you know, operation research is one part of uh, what we call as implementation research. When you talk about operations research, I think you're talking about taking interventions, uh, you know, how do you reach interventions to people? But implementation research, that's one part of the argument. You have uh, the thing, but implementation research includes operational research, applied research, action research, basic research, clinical research. So it's a continuum in terms of really looking at implementation research. So I would say implementation research is broad-based. Operations research is still a very small part of applied research. And sir, how can our PG students uh, put in implementation research or uh, do any implementation research during residency? Absolutely. More than doing implementation research, I think it's important that either as junior residents or senior residents, there should be a chapter or there should be a course or there should be some sort of lectures on implementation research to help people uh, to translate whatever they have learned as, you know, in theory. As junior residents, you have an opportunity to learn the concepts, to learn the theory and learn the thing. Very little, except in your PG thesis, et cetera, you don't have a lot of opportunity to implement it in real life situation. Again, there, most often than not, it's controlled sort of research, which you do as part and parcel of your PG, even if you do a randomized control trial, et cetera. Whereas senior resident, it gives you a little more you know, sort of freedom in terms of doing implementation research. But I would say at this point in time, get more capacity built within your system to do or to understand what's called as implementation research. And sir, is always finances or budgeting important in implementation research or without any budgeting also our students because to approve a budget during residency or at the level of being a resident or a senior resident may be difficult and everybody thinks that it is, if there is no funding, there may no, not be Absolutely. even a preliminary implementation research. Absolutely. And you hit the nail on the head, Priya. It's very important. And uh, as residents and as, uh, you know, people, we can't afford some of these, uh, you know, monies which we require for doing even basic tests or, you know, buying some medicines or doing some procedures, etc. So, 
I, like I said, it's not about efficacy, it's not about effectiveness, it's also about efficiency. When I talk about efficiency, I'm including an element of what is called as costs or the inputs versus the outputs. And uh, implementation research also looks at that particular question in terms of taking cost-effective interventions. Uh, say, for instance, uh, I can give you an example of how we have approached a particular problem in terms of, say, deworming, wherein you don't go house to house to give, you know, tablets of, uh, or you, you don't give anti-helminthics going house to house. You give it to the school or you give it to the community leader or a community opinion leader and ask him to distribute it, through which you are saving a lot of resources. So that's one programmatic intervention which you are able to do by doing implementation research. But at a residential level, I think it's important for us to understand that you're, you are limited in terms of how much you can do and you're limited in terms of how far you can go. But I would say as a resident, get to know what is implementation research. Thank you so much, sir, for sh sharing these valuable insights and giving our residents a lot of motivation that they can not only learn implementation research, but also implement implementation research. Sir. Coming to the end, I would like to take a moment to thank our PG coordinating team and all the office bearers for supporting us in this PG lecture series. We encourage you to become a member of IPSM if you are yet not one. Please do subscribe to the IPSM eConnect channel to stay tuned to our further events. As the moderator of this session, this is Dr. Priya Varni signing out. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, sir.